So hello everyone, uh, my name is Marco Ciacconi and I'm going to talk to you about uh, fractals and chaos and how can we explore this stuff in our own browser. Um, so before, before I start with my talk, I want to first of all thank developer, developer, developer uh, for having me uh, talk to you. And I would like to read um, our code of conduct, which in summary says, be aware of others, uh, be friendly and patient, be welcoming and respectful, be open to all questions and viewpoints, be understanding of differences, be kind and considerate to others. So these are, I think, six good rules to live by and not only to respect at DDD 2020, uh, if you want to read the full code of conduct uh, or report an issue, you can go to HTTPS uh, bit.ly slash DDD CFC. Um, a request, donate. If you like this, if you like this talk, please donate to the National Museum of Computing. I think it's a fantastic museum. I, um, I really want to go there as soon as COVID uh, and and I can we can travel again. I'm definitely gonna go there. It's a fantastic place. Go on Just Giving Fundraising Developer Day 2020. Finally, thanks to our sponsors. Without sponsors, there would be no DDD. So uh, of course, let's all thank Black Marble, Microsoft, Sage, Grey Matter, NDC London, Landmark, IO, and University of Hull. Finally, uh, please, please tweet about us, about this talk, about this conference using the hashtag uh, DDD2020 uh, or mention uh, at Developer Day on Twitter. OK, so without further ado, uh, let's make coding fun. Uh, we're going to install fractals in the browser. And Merry Christmas. OK, so uh, I Every year I, uh, I make uh, one or more talk uh, titled Make Coding Fun. They're all about doing something else with programming, which is not boring enterprise code. I usually uh, make demos in JavaScript. And the reason is, you know, is the sort of lingua franca or, you know, um, easily understandable language for everyone. And, um, and that's it. The purpose of these talks is to perhaps open your minds a bit and remind you that um, not all coding is about writing boring stuff or um, just doing a job, but it can also be fun. OK, a little bit about me. Uh, I am, have been a developer for um, 20 years, professional developer for 20 years. And in my career, uh, you may have heard of me because I was working in Stack Overflow when, uh, where I was one of the core developers. Um, I also worked at TopTal where I was the first engineering manager. And now I have my own company called Intelligent Hack. And uh, our purpose is to help companies and developers write the best code possible and in the most efficient way possible. So we go and help companies excel at programming. That said, let's, let's uh, start with a few definitions on what we're going to talk about. So we are all on the same page. Um, this talk will have um, has no um, prerequisite of knowing a lot about these kind of topics. So I'm, I'm going to be maybe a little bit pedantic, but I'm going to explain uh, the basics so everybody knows where we're at. So what is a fractal? A fractal is a self-similar regional space um, was fractal dimension exceeds its ordinary dimension. OK, it sounds like a bit, um, how can I say, self-referential, but basically what, what does this mean? It means that a fractal is um, a set or a region, um, a part of a space. Space can be either a plane, uh, it can be, it can be, you know, three-dimensional space or n-dimensional space, but in our case, it's going to be two or three dimensional space and a, a region that has some characteristics and uh, basically the most important one that is at different scales. Uh, this set 
reminds of itself. So for example, uh, it could be a set where if you take a small part of it and uh, you expand it, you know, so it's large the original set, you get the original set. So these are, uh, they may sound like mathematical monstrosities, but in fact, fractals are very common in nature. Um, one classic example can be um, a leaf and, and the tree and, you know, the, the structure of the tree, of the, of the branches is, is the same whether you look at the trunk and, and the main branches, or if you look one of the main branch, branches and sub-branches going all the way down to leaves, which have the same internal structure as the, as the, as the tree itself, so the tree shape. Um, so this is a classic example of uh, fractal in nature. Of course, in mathematics, there are much weirder things and some of them we're gonna see today. So what is the fractal dimension? A fractal dimension is a number that tells us um, how does the measure of a set or its size change based on the unit of measure? And we'll see that later in more detail. It sounds like very complicated, but it's in fact a very, very simple concept. The other thing we're going to talk about is chaos theory or chaos. So chaos theory is the study of apparently random behavior in systems governed by deterministic laws. So this is, sounds like a little bit of a contradiction in term. How is it possible that um, there are random, apparently random behaviors um, in systems where you know, all the laws are actually totally deterministic? And the reality is not that there are a million different deterministic laws, so that's why it's chaotic, but the reason is uh, one, all these uh, systems have one thing in common, uh, which is called um, the high dependence on initial conditions. So some systems, think about a simple pendulum, um, it's a, it, it will tend to swing and it has friction and friction will make it swing back to its rest position. Um, so this system is stable and non-chaotic. Um, no matter where you start, eventually the pendulum is going to end up in the same end position. So there is no dependence from the initial conditions. However, if you create a system of interconnected pendulums, you can create chaotic systems where no matter how hard you try to set the same initial conditions, the behavior after some time will diverge and uh, it will be completely unpredictable. And these are you know, governed by the same deterministic laws as normal pendulae. Okay, so given these two definitions, let's try to see something more, uh, more practical, shall we? Okay, so let's start with um, what is, you know, what, what is fractal, uh, fractal dimension and why would the measure or a length depend on the unit of measure? You know, a meter is a meter, whether you measure it in meters, decimeters, centimeters, it's still a meter, right? Well, not so much with fractal curves, um, because fractal curves have, are um, self-imitating and they have more and more details the more you look at a smaller scale. Um, in practice, their length tends to increase as uh, the scale decreases. One classic example of this is the coast of um, islands or countries. And this is interesting because, you know, it's very easy to, to, to visualize this. So imagine the, the coast of Britain and the coast of Britain, of course, is, you know, has all these sharp, uh, sharp turns and details and so on. If I measure it, uh, with a measuring rod, which is 200 kilometers, it's going to be something like this. What this means is that the measure that I'm going to have is going to be around 2,400 kilometers or 12 units of measure. If I use 100 kilometers, I can follow a little bit better the details. And so the measure which I will, we will see is 2,800 
kilometers. Why? Well, because you know, some, in some places I would have to go straight and uh, with a longer measurement rod, but now I can actually follow um, follow the, the shape of the coast. And let's try with 50 kilometers. With 50 kilometers, you get 3,450. Yeah, so you can see much, much more detail. Uh, as you can see, even at 50 kilometers, there are a lot of details which are still not uh, covered or measured correctly by uh, by the um, measurement rod that we choose. And of course, this measurement rod can go down to centimeters if you want to, or you know, millimeters or angstroms or whatever. So um, the length that we measure will be longer and longer and longer. Now, what is what is the fractal dimension? Well, the fractal dimension is a number which relates uh, the coast, uh, measured coast length, and the length of the rod. And in practice, this, this is the formula. So rod elevated to the minus dimension is equal to the length of the coast. So in other words, and uh, the dimension is the difference between the log of the coast and log of the rod. So you can measure this, of course, you know, you're going to not have one only measurement of the dimension, but you have to uh, do a graph in which uh, you set, you plot all the points of different rod lengths, uh, different coast lengths. And with this, you can actually calculate or measure the fractal dimension of the English coastline. And uh, usually it's going to be more than two. So it's the fractal dimension is more than is Euclidean dimension. And therefore, it's a coastline is a fractal. In fact, I'm not sure, but I think the uh, British coastline is 2.7 uh, dimension, fractal dimension. OK, so you're going to say, Marco, OK, why are you telling me this? You know, and you know, why are we talking about this? What has got to do with exploring stuff in the browser? Well, it's a premise, right? Because we, we can do a simplified version of this. Um, not of this measurement, but of a fractal based on this criteria in the browser. And the, the fractal I'm going to talk about is uh, the so-called Koch curve or Koch snowflake. And as you can see in this uh, animation, uh, the way the, um, the curve works is that you start with a segment, you divide it in three parts, and then uh, take away the middle part. In place of the middle part, you put two segments of the same length, um, angled 60 degrees. So in this way, you create like a spike. And as you can see in the first iteration, this leaves us with a length four, if you like, or four thirds uh, segment or series of segments. And we can take each one of these four segments and reapply the algorithm and we can apply it over and over and over and over. The more we do it, the more we add detail, and detail is always similar, right? So every segment is like um, a smaller version of the larger segment, yeah? So if you look at the first segment on the left, you will see that, you know, it's similar to the whole segment. And then, you know, the one on this third left is the same and so on and so on. All the other ones are still the same, just turned 60 degrees or 120 degrees and, and so on. Okay, that said, let's see how we can code this stuff. And with that, I'm going to betray my age and I am going to talk about something that is called Turtle, Turtle logo. So before I do that, I want to show you uh, I want to show you, well, the basic stuff. So, so the empty um, HTML file, which is my starting point, is just a canvas, as you can see here. And what do I have? I have a system by which I can draw points, right? So I take uh, the context. From the context, I create an image data. So it's an array which corresponds all these points, I just write stuff in there 
using this function to set a point, and then I can just delete the data on the screen with put image data. Okay, so this is the basic idea. Of course, if I don't need to set pixel by pixel data, I can use also the other canvas function that give me arcs, circles, um, fields, rectangles, text, all that I need. Okay, so let's start with, uh, with this example with turtle. So how does turtle work? Well, turtle is an object in this case by something that I created because it's for perhaps the easiest way of creating this kind of fractals. So what is turtle? Well, imagine that there is a turtle on your screen, invisible turtle, and you can tell the turtle to go forward. You can tell the, the turtle to start drawing and stop drawing, and you can tell the turtle to turn. And let's also add that you can uh, tell the turtle to move to a specific position. So if you do, if you do, if you use this kind of functions, you have a lot of nice um, and uh, interesting um, benefits. For example, let's say that you want to redraw the same um, set of um, segments at a different angle, well, you can just repeat the same comments that you gave to the turtle, but prefix that with a turn. So the, the, the turtle turns and then you repeat the same, this, the same steps and you will have the same image drawn at, at an angle. And that is useful because that is how the Koch uh, snowflake works. So uh, by using this, uh, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to write three curves. Um, one is going to be horizontal, one is going to be uh, angled backwards, and one is going to be angled backwards so 120 degrees more. So basically, it creates an hexagon instead of uh, just creating a sort of lineage uh, like this one. The other thing I'm going to do is to do it this way. Okay, so um, how do I create all these levels, right? So I set the scale, and the scale basically tells me how much to move. So if in the, in the, when I draw the original line, I will draw a line, say, on scale one. And when I do the next uh, sub, sub line, so the next level of iteration, um, the scale is going to be a third of that um, because the segment size is going to be a third. And um, by in this way, if I set a scale or a final scale of one over two hundred, well, I will keep I will keep recursing until the size of what I'm drawing is about uh, one two hundred of the standard um, of the initial segment. So. <clears throat> Let's say um, I use scale one here, for example. If I use scale one, then I should have, and I hope this is true, but I should have a single uh, segment being drawn three times. So you understand also how what how this works. So I'm what I'm saying here is draw a cock snowflake of size 200 up to a scale of one turn 120, draw a cock curve of scale of size 200, down to a detail of one and so on. Okay, so if I save this and try to load it from here. Okay, so not one, probably I should be putting here uh, something less, than, something more than one. But let's try two. Or maybe it's just a minimum I can do. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Um, yes, it's just a minimum. So uh, what I'm doing here, I'm writing this cock snow snow curve. Uh, sorry, cock snowflake curve of order one here, another one here, 
and another one here. Now, if I decrease the size of what I'm passing here to, let's say, one half, that's right. I should see a little bit more, probably. There you go. There is another level, right? So I, when I draw this line, I do, so the first a straight line, then one angle, and then for each one, one angle, right? So instead, go from one to four segments and to four to 16, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Now, if I go to somewhere really small, I'm gonna iterate more and more and more and I will get the full curve, right? So let's try 120th. And you can see it's already, you know, much more detailed. And if I go all the way down to 1 to 100, well, 1 to 100 means that the detail is gonna be one pixel, you know, because 1 to 100 of 200 is one. So I see the full the full scale, the full resolution Cox Snowflake here. Just to explain better which part is which, yeah, I can make them of different um, uh, with different uh, with different resolutions. So this one we can make 100, and this one we can make 50. Let's see what happens. Yes, same. Uh, it's probably still not, not enough. Let's make this 120, 120. Okay. No. There we go. So uh, <laughs> this is two iterations. This is, well, many more than two, uh, four iterations, and this one's got many. Right, so as you can see, the you know, the, this snowflake has been iterated. So there is a straight line. This one is 200. This, the, 20, the 120th one is this one, and one half one is this one. Okay, and basically this is also like the length, right, of this curve is also the length of the curve measured at the scale specified by the scale factor, right? So. By this, in a way, we are also exploring the concept of fractal dimension, right? Because the first, the first uh, line that you draw has length 200, the second, the second one has four thirds of 200, right? So that would be 60, 270 or something like that. Um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it, it tends to infinity as the size goes to zero. Yeah, so this is an infinite long curve in a finite long space. This is also why <clears throat> this kind of curves tend to be almost in the next dimension. Its dimension is more than one because it occupies so much of the plane. Okay, so this is um, um, this is the Cox snowflake. And let's see what else we can do, right? So the, the boring bit about, about this is that, you know, it's so predictable. And it doesn't, you know, shows you nicely the feature of fractals, but it doesn't show you the features of chaos. So let's look at that a little bit more in, more in detail. So um, chaos, uh, one, one may think that creating a chaotic system is a complicated mathematical thing. In reality, chaos is really common in all dynamic systems or recursive systems. And, um, and you know, this is perfectly, I, I think perfectly exemplified by the following function. So you start with a point, between zero and one, x zero, let's call it 0 0.5. So straight in the middle between uh, zero and one. Now let's iterate over this based on a parameter r. So given the nth iteration, I multiply 
its value by one minus its value, so we can make it sort of symmetrical around the um, ends of the um, segment of validity of this iteration. And then uh, I multiply by R and I get the new, the new version. Uh, of course, uh, this basically what it means, it means that if a value is very close to one, the next iteration is going to be penalized, right? Because one minus the iteration is going to be very close to zero. And also if it's very close to zero, uh, it's, you know, it's going it, it, to be penalized too. So it creates a sort of um, strange system. Right, for example, let's say the R is one, so just to simplify. Well, what are the values? Well, the first one is 0 0.5, right? Because that's the starting point. The second one is 0 0.5 times one minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.25. Then is 0 0.25 times 0 0.75, which is this and so on and so forth. So you can see this is, you know, you can see it from here, we could calculate a little more terms, but this basically starts at half and gently slopes down to zero or very close to zero. Okay, so with this parameter, um, we have this kind of sequence. Now, varying these parameters, we're gonna see different behaviors, right? And this is what makes, uh, makes, it, makes this interest, interesting. Okay, um, okay, just a second that there is a problem with my presentation. But no matter, I can always, I can always recover it and I have, so here we go. Okay, so chaotic systems, here we go, this one. Okay, so let's start to see a, a simple chaotic system based on this uh, on this function. And I have uh, this code here. So how does this code work? Um, okay, so let's start with the simplest thing and, and probably it is that I show you in the browser how this works. And here we go. So let's see. Okay, so this is a function. The value here, the starting value, as you can see, is going to be three, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, var r equals three. Okay, so with a value of three, you can see that we start from 0 0.5, we spring up and then sort of oscillate around, uh, around the value and we end up being almost um, stable, stable to a final version. If I move it left a bit, so we decrease R, you can see that definitely this stays stable. And the more I increase R, the more the, the oscillation, the oscillations become prevalent. And in this case, I think, I'm not sure, but I think it may be that um, the function never settles. You know, it finds a new um, stable point, which is based on, or semi-stable point, based on two points. So, uh, if I increase R, then there are going to be two values uh, between uh, which the function oscillates as I iterate. If I increase it more, there, you know, this oscillation increases. Now, before I, we go on exploring what happens with changing R, let me show you the code so you understand how this works. Okay, so the first part I've shown you, and it's not here, you don't see drop propagation I haven't used, but um, basically on change of the range, I just call the function draw. The function draw, what does it do? It cleans the screen, it starts from 0 0.5, and then what it does, it, it iterates over uh, the function that I've shown you before, and for each, one, I move 12 pixels to the left and I just throw the graph, right? So, um, you know, it creates 1000 points. That's it. As simple as that, uh, I just throw this line from left to right with, the, with all the values. 
Okay, so let's see let's see what happens if we explore it a little bit further. And here goes. Okay, so if we increase it a bit more, so now it's stable on two values. If I increase it a bit, a little bit more, what happens? You know, the fork opens. And what happens here? Well, what happens here is that you're starting to see some semi chaotic behavior. So this is stable on two, stable on two, move it a little bit to the right. It's still stable, more. Okay, now if you look closely, well, you can see here that you have a new form of stability because this is self repeating, right? It's a fractal, but it has 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Yeah, so this is a quarter stable oscillation. This is an oscillation between four points. Really strange. And as I move further, it seems to oscillate, but now it has this moment of, I don't know, you know, unpredictable behavior that just goes back. If I increase it a little bit more, well, this is chaotic, right? I mean, it seems to start stable, but look at that. It's completely, completely unpredictable. And if I go on again, unpredictable, unpredictable. And look at this, not only it's unpredictable, but it has moments in which it seems to oscillate. So it's almost like it's almost stable at this point. And then well, it just goes out. And here as well. And this is actually an important point. Uh, what does this mean, right? Why does this happen? This happens because uh, is a chaotic system. A chaotic system have uh, strong dependence from initial conditions, right? So even though these two points or this point here is finely tuned to be exactly a point in which uh, we can uh, have a sort of semi-stable situation. In one, two, three, four, on the fifth iteration, the imprecision with which we can set this point is already made the system unstable, and so it just goes out. And you can think about this as you know a pendulum, uh, which is upside down, right? Theoretically, if you balance it perfectly, you can leave it uh, balanced outside, uh, upside down and it will always stay there. But any small deviation of any size from the top ultimately is going to result in it falling down to its rest position. So in this, a, this is a, a very similar concept, except instead of falling down to a stable position, it falls down into chaos. OK, so another way of uh, seeing all this kind of behavior is to do this, right? So I just take the last bit of this curve and I memorize where this point is plotted, right? So on a scale of 1 to 100, if you want, uh, this is going to be maybe uh, 50. So a lot of points here is 0.50 being plotted. As I move forward and I get the first, the first bifurcation, here, you know, right? And you have a two points. I'm going to have two points in my uh, in my diagram. And you know, if I get the four one now, yeah, this one, you're going to have four points in the diagram. And ultimately, if I get to this, I'm going to have like white noise, you know, all the possible values. And um, so this bifurcation diagram, what it does is changes R from an initial value. I think of three to a five or two to a final value of four and point and plots out all the all the resulting um, end results of, of the oscillation. Let's see what happens. OK, so this is what happens. And as you can see, this is a very, very interesting shape. You know, would you imagine that something like this would come out? of such a simple equation, right? Obviously not, but th that's how it is. Interesting stuff. So um, moving on, 
you can see that in the beginning, so up to say about three, I have only one value, right? So it settles to a, to a specific value that is depends on R and it's, you know, it's a sort of ever increasing kind of function. At this magic point here, around three, the, side, the system becomes bistable, right? There's two stability points. And so uh, it will oscillate between these two, oscillate, oscillate, and this is going to be larger and larger and larger. And at the end, we get the four points, one, two, three, four, as we saw before. What we didn't see, and we can get from this, is that actually you can you, you get more, right? You get eight, and then if you look closely, there's going to be 16. You have to fine tune R more and more and more to get this kind of uh, behaviors, but you do. And then chaos ensues. And um, even though chaos, it still has a maximum, I mean, in the minimum, which are not the complete set of zero to one. Also, what you can see here in, in, in the middle is this white stripes. These white stripes are interesting because uh, they are not mistakes in the program. This is like exactly how the system works. And when you get here, you have a system with one, two, and three states. So a three state pendulum, and then you get six, and then, or, or I don't know if it gets to, to six or to nine. I don't know if this bifurcates or trifurcates. And, and as you can see here, there are more self-similar portions where uh, there are different stability points. So this system is very, very complicated and even um, predicting whether you know, something will be chaotic or not in this area here, it becomes something which you cannot do without actually running the simulation. Okay, so this is interesting because um, I can show you, I, I can show you something that a few, a few features in here that are very interesting. One is, you know, this sort of one to two, two to four, four to eight. This is a fractal, right? So this shape is a fractal structure. But then again, you know, by just changing one parameter, we switch between uh, predictable behavior and unpredictable behavior, even though the, the laws are completely deterministic. And, and so this shows a little bit of uh, overlap between the domain of, uh, um, of fractals and the domain of chaos. Another way that you can see this, but the other way around is how can we get from chaos to fractals? You know, a, a system which should be inherently chaotic, how can we make it fractal and predictable? Well, um, this was taught to me by math teacher in high school, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not complicated at all. Um, what we're going to draw is this so-called Sierpinski triangle, which is another famous fractal. Um, if you don't know what it is, worry not. And as soon as you see it, you will recognize it. Anyway, so we're going to use the empty canvas thing. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw, well, 100,000 points. So for each point, I'm going to start for at position one, one, okay, on the, on the, on the plane. And then, I have a scale factor of 0 0.5. This scale factor is something that is the corresponding um, the corresponding um, how do you say the equivalent of R in the previous equation, the previous system. Um, just because you know I use R for random here, so I use scale for that. So. I want to draw, let's say, uh, 100,000 points. So this cycle of 100,000 points, what I'm going to do with them is I'm going to, well, I am going to uh, take a random number and then based on that, I will apply three different transformations. One, it boosts it to the right, one boosts it to the top, and the other one boosts it to the left, right? So what I'm creating here is three sort of attractors, right? So there is the point of, is one, one, um, 
to zero and zero, zero. This point will tend to attract pixels, right? Why? Well, because as you can see here, um, well, this just throws the pixel. Uh, what you can see here is that the pixel is going to, uh, you know, get smaller and smaller because this constant is less than 0 0.5, right? So it's going to be get closer and closer to one of these three points based on R, but R changes, right? And uh, and so, well, the behavior changes too. So that's that's how this works, right? So it's, what is going to be is just going to be one point, right? Uh, if you like, that is, you know, being pulled between these three different attractors and we are going to plot a point on the screen for each one of the iterations right so in the end we will put down 100,000 points but they're going to be let's say the orbit the 2d orbit of this system okay and so if we put this let's say to 0 0.7 let's start with that we get something that I think you're going to predict right with 0 0.7 we're going to get a chaotic system let's see it So yes, yeah, Pinsky, here we go. And there you go. This is the, the, the system uh, being drawn. Points are all over the place. It's just, you know, well, they don't go under the zero line, which is this line here, because there is no way they can do that mathematically. But besides that, there is a vague shape, if you see here with triangle, and like some points are not here on top, but they are in the bottom, but this is a chaotic system. No ifs and no buts. Right, so let's make this uh, 0 0.5 and see what happens. Right. OK, so before we do that, I want to point out that this is a completely random system, right? So every time I draw this, I just use random, right? For each point that I draw, there's a random being taken out. If I refresh the page with the same value, I'm going to get a different drawing, right? Because random is going to be different, hopefully. So it shouldn't really be that regular, right? Like this one, like this one, maybe it will always look like this, like a sort of a blurry triangle thingy with points everywhere. But the points are not going to be the same if I refresh. Uh, let's see what happens with 0 0.5. Voila! It's this Pinsky triangle. How is that possible, right? So maybe it's just a fluke, right? Maybe it's just the, the 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 random number which I chose. So let me refresh. As you can see, it sort of changes if your resolution is high enough. It sort of changes, right? And some pixels are being lit, some pixels aren't being lit, but the shape is the same. And the reason of this is that we created an attractive system uh, which has some very, very specific places uh, where, you know, things are attracted uh, to be. And, you know, there's uh, there these three points, but then also this halfway point is important because it's, so it's more important in this one because, or it's comparably as important in this one because it has the strength, is the combination of these two, right? So whether it, the R points into this point or to this point, it will tend to go this in this way. Interesting. Um, yeah. Now what happens if we make it even smaller? Well, let's let's, let's check it out. Uh, Zero point three. Well, it's going to be fractal, right? And it is, but it becomes more like a dust. Right now, the compression is too much. And so really the points don't bounce around that much and they just end up here. Let's try to make it a little bit bigger, 0 0.8. Let's see what happens. Messy, 0.6.
Wow, what about this? Yeah, this is a sort of a Sierpinski gasket, but it's blurry like it's an acid or something. I don't know. These are complex systems. And again, though, this there is order in the random numbers. And this is very interesting to me, at least. Uh, it's a way of, you know, going backwards from chaos to non-chaos. Okay, so um, we, it's, it's 2.45. I still have only some time for questions theoretically, but can still go on talking about things. Um, so if there are questions, please ask them straight away. Otherwise I will take some more time and go on for at least a little bit tour, a, a very small tour of the Mandelbrot set. Okay, just interrupt me if there are any questions, don't worry about that. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'll just go on so we don't waste time. Uh, let's talk about the Mandelbrot set, and uh, here it is. Okay, so actually, let me go back one slide. Um, so this is the previous one. As you can see, we start with the point 0 0.5. We iterate, um, you know, in uh, algorithmic fashion. We recurse over a function over and over and over. Right? This function looks like it's a multiplication, and fundamentally, what what is tantamount to a squaring. Now we can do the same and we can do the same uh, but uh, with complex numbers. I hope you know what complex numbers are. I did not put in a slide explaining that, although probably should have. But anyways, complex numbers are numbers um, which are an extension of real numbers, which are the normal fractional float numbers that we are all um, familiar with, with the difference that they also include uh, numbers, which are called imaginary numbers. And these imaginary numbers have the, part, part, uh, have the characteristic that if they are squared, they are negative. So they complete the uh, square root to, uh, with with um, all negative numbers. Okay, so uh, multiple set is drawn like this. We we'll start with the point called Z zero, the first point of the sequence. Sequence, as you can imagine, which starts with zero, right? Zero is zero in the complex plane. Um, by the way, uh, complex numbers do not stay on a line normally. Uh, they do stay on a plane, and that is because they have two parts. One part is the real part, and one part is the imaginary part, as I was telling before. So, an imaginary number is the sum of, a, sorry, a complex number is the sum of an imaginary part and, and the real part, and they can be uh, the two coordinates we use on a plane. So, it's very common to represent them on a plane. So for every point on, on the complex plane, what do I do? I take the number, Z0 for example, I square it, so you can see the similarity as before, and I mult instead of multiplying, I just add a point, and then I get the next iteration. I iterate over and over and over, and now if the modulus of this number and the modulus is calculated basically by using um, Pythagoras theorem on the point on the plane which represents the number. So the distance from the origin is, uh, is the modulus of a number. If the modulus is more than two, then um, that point is sort of conventionally declared lost. Well, not conventionally, it, it is uh, it means that this sequence will diverge and it will go over um, over to infinity as n goes to infinity. Instead, uh, if the number stays uh, limited by this you know, unit circle or two units circle uh, on the complex plane, then we don't know whether it will diverge or converge, but we know that you know if it stays inside the circle for a very long time, then we declare it bounded. And uh, 
Uh, and that's it, right? So for example, let's start with point, you know, let's see, let's calculate the Mandelbrot set at point uh, C, which is one plus uh, uh, one I, right? So this is a complex number of quote, quote, coordinates one, one. Okay, so the first, uh, the first iteration is zero, Z zero is zero, Z one, well, zero squared plus the number is one plus one I, and then it's one plus three I, which is already diverging, 11 plus seven I, so this will diverge. And so what do we do? We want to calculate these sequences for every point in the plane, of course, not really literally every point, but every point that we want to display. And uh, the ones that diverge, um, the ones that do not diverge in say 200, 2000, whatever, in a certain number of iterations that we decide, we declare they are part of the Mandelbrot set and we're going to paint them black. If they do, if they do diverge, then each one will diverge in a different number of iterations. Well, not each one a different one, but the number of iterations becomes important. In this case, this, so the, the length or the distance from this, from the center in here is one plus one squared is uh, two, so square root of square root of two, which is less than two. So this is not divergent yet, but this one is one plus nine square root of 10, which is more than two. And so at this point, so at iteration zero, one, two, right? At iteration two, this diverges. So I will color this with a color corresponding to the number two. I will have a set of colors. And if it diverged on the first iteration, you know, it would be colored with the color one and zero, the color zero. And of course, you know, the only points that get colored black are the points that do not diverge at all. So they don't have any other color. Okay, so that said, um, that said, let's see some code. And uh, Mandelbrot it is, here we go. So how does this work? Well, first of all, I created a class to calculate complex numbers because I'm a developer and just need to create a class for some bits, but basically, is, I just use it for output for in large part, and what it does is, you know, it takes care of having an imaginary part, a real part, calculating the magnitude or distance uh, from the center square. Now, uh, I take all the points that I want to draw, right? So from the bottom of the canvas to the top, from the left to the right of the canvas, I have a scale factor because you're going to be wanting to move around the Mandelbrot set because you want to visit different parts and scale them up and down because it's a beautiful set. Um, anyway, so by using the scale, I can uh, I can calculate what all these points of X and Y on the screen correspond to. But basically what I do while the magnitude of my point is less than four, so that means the square root of this is less than two, and the iterations are not uh, over the maximum iteration which I set. I create a square, which is, you know, this is the formula for a square, the real part of the square of the complex number plus the number. Um, I assign to Y, I, the y part of the of the square and then to xi the temporary value which is the x the x part of the next iteration and i count the iteration up so basically i am applying that formula that you saw no you know just just like that at the end of this loop i i check well, well if it's max iteration then it's color zero otherwise i just pick one color from the palette the palette is this very long and boring array, but it makes pretty colors, which is what we want in this case. Then after I finish calculating this for every single pixel, bunch of them, I just print it. Okay, so that's, that's as simple as that. I'm gonna start 
I'm going to start with these boundaries, which is minus 2.1x, uh, minus 2.1 plus 1.2i, and 1.1 minus 1.2i. And let's see what happens. Here goes. Okay, so this is it. And guys, I mean, I think this is fantastic, right? I mean, how can this come out of that simple formula? Still very, very absurd. Um, if you want to see, okay, so it goes from minus two to one, basically. So the axes are here and here. So this sort of skewer and the skewer here, the, the system, in fact, this one goes all the way to one. Um, and as you can see, there are more and more details, right? And the, the length it takes to go to infinity is, well, is instant if you go over two, obviously, but, you know, it takes more and more and more time and it gets more and more complex. And as you can see, this sort of ball with other balls coming out, it's repeated over and over and over. And if you look here, there is another set. In fact, I did not write a full explorer because A, it's a lot of work, and B, there's plenty of people who have done it better than me. And, and so it doesn't really matter. But you can you can see here, mandel.gart.nz, this is a fantastic in the browser, in the browser explorer. And you can, you know, sort of zoom in by using the scroll wheel. You can notice that here there is another set. This is a replica, so this is a fractal. And you can see these are these fantastic valleys of, you know, returning things. Now the iterations are not enough. But if you look at this smaller bits here, here we go. Here is some sort of dust. Yeah, like a dragon. It's called a dragon, I think, this one. If you can inside the dragon, lo and behold, there is another vulnerable set. But it's time different, right? Need to increase the iterations here. And now there is dust here and more dust. And I don't know, is that going to be all, only dust or is it going to be some set? Who knows? I bet you there's going to be a set there in the middle somewhere. There we go. And there is a set there indeed. OK, it looks like a blurry thing because I don't have enough iteration. I need more than 1,500 to actually see it. And we are, we are really zoomed in. Yeah, so this one, all these ones are like 1,300 already. Anyways. So there, there's, there is it. There it is. This is the Mandelbrot set, and you know each point represents uh, one sequence that is calculated. Oh, I'm not even there. There we go. And the way you see it in mine, let me show the axis. Yeah, it's a bit, little bit like this. So I centered it. I try to make yeah, mine's a little bit like that. What is interesting here is the fact that you know there is this limit here of 0 0.25. Um, there are a few other known known properties of this of this set which are interesting. Um, for example, there is a connected set, so all the black points they form a set which you can where you can walk from any point to any other point without passing through the color set just need to be much more in detail. Anyway, so it's one minute to, to three. I think I am out of time. I really wanted to go over Julia Seth's Game of Life, um, Wolfram series and so on, but that's all the time we have for today. So apologies. If you have any questions, I'm going to be here. And just to remind you, uh, my name is Marco Cecconi, and I'm going to be, I, I sorry, here we go. Um, my company is Intelligent Hack. If you need, um, 
if you need any support in your company for refactoring, fixing legacy code, improving your processes, implementing agile or remote work, and we are a bunch of experts coming from Stack Overflow, TopTal, and these, uh, these kind of companies. And we help companies achieve this, the, the potential. So that's it. If there is any questions, I'm going to be here for a little while answering them. Otherwise, have a nice day and have fun with the next uh, talk. <laughs>